Anyways, we're here today to talk about HTTP2. And if, you're, if you were at .js 2015, or you're just a big fan of watching .js videos on YouTube, you may know that year when HTTP2 was released, Rebecca Murphy actually gave a really great talk um, on the .js stage. And she wanted to know, like, in the future, how would we be handling HTTP2? Like, what would we be doing with it? So we are in the future. <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about three years from that point, what we're doing uh, with HTTP2 for me and for you. Uh, she asked some really great questions, and today we're kind of going to look at answering a bit of those. We're going to talk about HTTP2 for servers, so talking about how servers are handling it, how to do that. We're going to look at uh, HTTP2 for investigators, and that's basically saying, like, all of us, when we use HTTP2, we want to see what's going on. How can we do that? And then we'll also look at HTTP2 for your applications in particular. So I am your guide for this today. <laughs> My name, um, as Christoph said, is Tara Maniksik. I'm a dev advocate for Progress Convey, <laughs> a Google developer expert. I don't even know what is making the mic go, so I'm trying to dance around in a particular position. Um, and I started the Women Who Code branch in Cincinnati and the Node School in Cincinnati. So if you put two and two together, I am from Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> um, which actually, uh, Kurt from Chicago, I'm glad they like coupled the Midwesterners together to give you an after lunch Midwestern boost. But uh, um, I actually have been to Paris twice this year. I'm very happy to be here. I was here earlier for a React conference around May. So uh, this baby that I'm growing inside me has actually been to Paris twice already before it's even out of the room. So it's either going to be like very cultured or very jet lagged, but it's going to know what like async await is for sure. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I'm going to have my slides up uh, from my Twitter handle, TZ Mannix, that will have a bunch of resources that I talk about today. So feel free to take pictures of slides, but also uh, you can find them later. So uh, if you all want to nap on the bean bags, that's fine too. <laughs> and I had to put this picture up here because this is as, uh, that bundle of weird fur is my dog, Toj Magosh, and I always have to share her with the world. <laughs> so um, I've always been really interested in HTTP2 because it's the foundation of communication for the web. Like, oh, well, it's pretty cool, right? But then I did a podcast. Um, I got to guest host Always Forward with Disha, um, a dev-related one on HTTP2. This is a node-centric podcast. So I interviewed uh, Anna Henningsen, Anatoly Paparovsky, and James Snell just to talk about what Node is doing with HTTP2. So that made it so I could really dive in. So I want to give you a few notes on HTTP2 in case you're not as familiar with what's out there. And that's why you're not using it. Um, I like to call these uh, like the good and bad, or what I call uh, the oohs and the boos. <laughs> so the first one you may have heard of already, multiplexing. So multiplexing is basically sending multiple requests over a single TCP connection. And actually, HTTP2 keeps that connection open longer than we had with HTTP1. It's a replacement for many things that you're doing, like inlining, and makes anti-patterns out of domain sharding and file concatenation. And that was kind of the main goal, is to have fewer open TCP connections. Um, so a lot of these things, like inlining and um, domain sharding, were all hacking we did to make HTTP1 work well for us. So that's where this multiplexing comes in. And I want to kind of break this down, because this is my, one of my favorite things to do, is kind of like dig in deep to really understand what's happening there. So through the connection messages, um, you have, through the connection, you have these messages passed through logical streams. And these messages are a sequence of frames. And frames are the smallest unit of communication that we have. So a response and request is basically frames collated. So when you have these multiple streams that flow over the connection, they can be interweaved and be going simultaneously. 
And this all happens over a single socket, hence multiplexing. I just thought that was so cool. Like, <laughs> I hope you do too. Um, so, when the other thing that we have then is, a binary, is the binary framing layer. So HTTP 1 was textual, and now we have binary. And so it's like lightweight and secure and fast. And everything that we talked about with streams and messages is thanks to the binary protocol because it breaks all the communication down into those frames, into those small units. Then uh, there is also the header compression, and we get this through HPAC. And HPAC was made to reduce the overhead, and the overhead was caused because we were getting um, duplication of header information between the client and the server. They did this, they solved this, and it achieved great compression <laughs> um, by requiring both the client and the server to maintain a list of header fields. And so that information is used to create those messages. We also have stream prioritization. And this means that it gives, you, gives developers more power. So dependencies can be, be defined to allow one resource to be loaded before another, you know, prioritizing. Um, and you can mix this into a dependency tree so that you can control the importance of each stream. So that's kind of the four top exciting things. And you may notice one of the most popular things is not on my ooze list. It's on my booze list. <laughs> and that's server push. Not because of anything about um, how great this concept and technology is, but there's still no good strategy or best practices for us developers to know how to use this. Even on the Apache page, it says, um, to summarize, there is no no one good strategy on how to make best use of this feature, and everyone is still experimenting. Like, that's in documentation. <laughs> it's like, okay, you can, yes, we get it, excuses. But, but it's really tough still, because on Apache servers, clients can still disable server push, and the only way a server can send this information is from a client request. So you're kind of out of luck. And then this is a bit debated, but there's still talk that the pushing resources that require a cookie to be present will just not work. So it's not so much technology, but that we don't have the use of it well formatted yet. Um, and then there's still this HTTP 1 compatibility. Node has a compatibility API, which is really great. And they say that you know, the fundamentals of HTTP haven't changed. Uh, the semantics haven't changed. And if you know HTTP 1, you know 95% of HTTP 2. But this, the, the obstacle of compatibility is still there because there's complexity and a lack of guidance. Um, so those were kind of the things that we're trying to solve. So let's jump into seeing what some of these solutions look like. Since uh, this is the main question, right? How is your server going to handle it? Since this is such a short talk, I decided to kind of just walk you through how to set up your Apache server um, and talk about each of those things so you can see like a high-level overview of how to actually do it. So um, Apache actually has an implementation on their HTTPD, uh, and they're very, they're very confident in it. They, uh, their description is like, it's production ready, all in italics. And uh, you may expect, you like, no, no changes of the interfaces and directives and releases. So they're very confident. <laughs> and to do this, uh, they use one of their modules. And they got really creative with the name for the module. It's mod HTTP2, you know, keeping it very simple and good. Um, and it's using ng HTTP2 as the implementation base. So when you're configuring it, though, you basically just have to pass a parameter to let it know to enable HTTP2. And it reminds you that, um, as we'll see with the browser compatibility, HTTP2 can only work on HTTPS. So you have to make sure that you have, uh, you need a server with SSL support. But on top of that, you have to make sure that you have the SSL library that supports AOPN which is the application layer protocol. So um, there's a weighing between simplicity and not. Because uh, you'll see in these directions, it looks quite simple, but there's always like these little catches 
as you go through. So this is what it looks like. You want to load the module, so you just load the module, which is nice. Um, and then you want to add protocols. The first one you add here allows H2 to be the preferred protocol on your server connections. And when you want to enable all of the HTTP2 variants, you just set this protocol here. Um, and then you also have the ability, a client can decide what they want their protocols to be, and you can set that with their protocol's honor order. Uh, but going into uh, server push, with mod HTTP2, it, ins it inspects the response header for link headers, uh, which is like one of the preferred ways to do it right now. And it looks for a format that looks like this. Um, and you can set that, uh, basically you can, you can set that here or in your application or on your server, you can configure it with location tags that look like this. So that's pretty, everybody's uh, typed something like that at some point in their life, right? <laughs> some angle brackets and letters. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, and N um, Nginx actually has an HTTP2 parameter in their listen directive to help you set that up. So things are getting simpler. They're trying to get more developer friendly. They're trying to make it easy. But it's kind of a bit of sugar coating. Uh, you, when you really delve in to understand what's going on, you'll be encountering more the further you go. But let's ignore that for now. Because <laughs> um, we could get it, we can get it working, right? So how can we visualize this? Uh, one of the things that Rebecca said in her talk was basically that she believed that front-end developers were going to be the people that really championed HTTP2 and got the most out of it. So she wanted tools to be able to visualize how this works, what's going on behind the scenes, and what's actually happening when you use HTTP2. She made a great one. Check out her talk to uh, see that. Um, but you can also check out a very simple way of doing it by putting, just clicking your uh, domain into this uh, field. And it will do HTTP2, then turn it off, and you can see the difference between HTTP1 and HTTP2. Uh, GitHub also has a console debugger. Uh, H2I is an interactive, uh, or it's on GitHub, sorry. Um, it has an interactive HTTP2 console debugger. And then there is also ng-http2, which we talked about. They also have a non-interactive command line um, that has a bunch of ways for debugging options. Um, there's a bunch of resources here at uh, HTTP2's uh, GitHub repo, and they try to keep track of all the tools that help you visualize and debug and analyze your HTTP2. So again, these resources will all be available soon. So this is pretty dry. <laughs> So I wanted to take a little joke break. And um, I would be really remiss if I did not use one of my favorite jokes here in Paris. So I hope, uh, I hope you like it. <laughs> OK. Um, and remember, if you know the answer, you, you can shout it out and ruin it for everyone else if you want to. Um, so what do you call a French man wearing sandals? Philippe Falop. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So all the rest of the slides are just jokes now that you liked that one. No. <laughs> okay. Back to the serious content. I don't know how to follow that now. Um, I'm gonna. I better get a raise for that joke now. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> How will, can you take me seriously after that? Can I continue with a serious talk after that? So how will your app work with HTTP2? I want to run through um, just a bunch of different references that you can use that are out there to help you build your application. But one of the first things that matters is how the browser is going to handle HTTP2. So you can just update your browser to the latest version, and you'll, get to, you'll be able to use HTTP2. As you see here, the major versions of the major browsers all support it. But there's a note on most all of them that it has to be over a secure connection. It has to be HTTPS. You can also go in, and in Chrome DevTools, you can go to the Network tab, right-click inside the headers, add a uh, protocol header there, and then refresh the page to see what is being used. And I picked on .js because there is no HTTP2 usage. But I came here anyway. Um, but as you see here, uh, like on the Google site, uh, they are using HTTP2, and you can see it come through there and take a look at it. 
But other resources that actually help you with creating applications. So there's this, uh, does anybody here use StackBlitz? It's an online IDE. I highly recommend it, um, especially for teaching, and you can do uh, code sharing on it as well. Um, Albert and Eric created this, and it's a really great tool. It's built on VS Code. But there is an Angular project where it shows you the structure, it shows you a skeleton of how to uh, use HTTP2 in Angular, and then lets you play around, hit buttons, and see the reaction that you get there. Then um, for the view tool, there's a minimal framework called uh, Nuxt. That one's always hard to get out. But they actually just released HTTP2 push on their latest version, version 2. And as I started this talk, Node has a bunch of, they've been doing a bunch of work to do a lot of HTTP2 features. And there's a great blog post by Mateo talking about how they did that um, and showing you what the code looks like here. You see you're creating that secure connection, setting HTTP2 true. And then they, uh, Fastify has an auto push that will push your resources from a directory that you state. Um, so a lot of tools making it, trying to make it a lot easier for you to actually implement this. Um, and pulling those together, client and server, they have on the HTTP2 spec a list of places where HTTP2 is implemented. So you can go through that list, see if what you need is there, and use those tools, check it out. I wanted to say um, one more thing, um, but before I do, um, <laughs> I just wanted to say that this has been three years, right? It's a work in progress, but so is JavaScript. Right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have ECMAScript. Um, so everything, this is all a work in project, progress. And it's something that uh, is worth making the web better, making it better for us developers. And the users don't care what you're using back there and how you're using it. They just want their stuff fast. Right? Um, but I will say that there are more resources. There are a lot more resources. It is being used. Um, it isn't that scary. <laughs> it just needs to be a bit more dev friendly. Um, so the one more thing that I wanted to say is uh, if you feel, since you're here, learning a ton, if you want to share your wealth of knowledge, I just saw this tweet yesterday from Jana um, after watching a talk from Joe Franchetti talking about many organizations that would re could really use great mentors. And I have a feeling that a lot of you out there are great mentors in waiting. So um, I added to the list, if you want to find this later, um, a bunch of different organizations that would love remote mentors, any kind of help in the organization, and just any time that you can give. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you being here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>